This is Amplifying Local Voices, a view of health equity from potentially underserved or disadvantaged groups. And we're going to hear from three organizations. Let me tell you what we've asked them to cover. What's happening with the group that they represent that we need to be aware of as healthcare providers? What are the challenges and opportunities that these present? Each organization will have nine minutes to make their presentation, and then we'll have a 30-minute open forum, 10 minutes to discuss your questions. What did we hear? What are our reactions? And what are our questions of understanding? And from whom? And for whom? What question for whom? And then you'll have 20 minutes of Q&A. I will introduce our panelists, their full bios uh, about the organization and about each of the speakers is on the Oz Hall website, QR code, bottom of the agenda, also right here. I'm going to start with Kim Russell. Kim, raise your hand. Say, wave to the crowd. Um, Kim is, let me get my introduction. She's from Chinle, Arizona, a citizen of the Navajo Nation. She is the director of the Arizona Advisory Council on Indian Health Care, which is an independent state agency whose mission is to advocate for increasing access to high-quality health care programs for all American Indians in Arizona. The uh, Arizona Advisory Council on Indian Health Care's mission is to advocate for increasing access to high-quality health care programs for all American Indians in Arizona. So welcome, Kim. Yeah, clap for Kim. Clap for Kim. All right, next we have Kim Menard. Wave to the crowd. Yay. Kim is the deaf specialist <laughs> with the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. As a deaf specialist, she provides information and referrals, empowerment and community development, outreach, education, and other services. The Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing is a national leader in the provision of communication access, support services, and community empowerment throughout the state of Arizona. Yay, Kim. <laughs> Next, we have Kim Desprez. Depre. Depre. You're French. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I won't go into Versailles, Kentucky, but um, we have Kim Depre. She is the Chief Executive Officer of Circle the City. Founded by Sister Adele O'Sullivan, Circle the City's mission is to create and deliver innovative healthcare solutions that compassionately address the needs of men, women, and children facing homelessness. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. And lastly, but not leastly, not a word, <laughs> we have Danielle Miller. Millard. Yeah. Millard. I'm going to stay with my French. I'm going to speak French the rest of the meeting. Um, Danielle Millard is a Circle the City board member. She brings a unique perspective. Having faced homelessness herself due to chronic health conditions, she understands firsthand the struggles many individuals in similar situations face. Her experience has fueled her passion for the intersection of homelessness and health leading her to become an advocate for those who are often overlooked and underserved. Welcome, Danielle. All right, so that's your panel. Um, we didn't draw straws to see who goes first. You'll have to arm wrestle. Um, how about you all go first, your first picture? Sure. And each panelist <laughs> has nine minutes, and then we'll do our open forum. So hold your questions until the open forum. But you can write them down so you don't forget them. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm going to have Danielle do most of the talking here. She has a, an incredible wealth of knowledge and advice and um, experience that I'd like her to share. Uh, we already did the introduction about Circle the City. I'll do a very brief uh, kind of recap of what we do, but we were founded by Sister Adele O'Sullivan. Um, she is a pharmacist, believe it or not, by background, and also a family practice physician, which is, I think, a little bit unheard of for nuns, uh, but she's pretty dynamite. She was the medical director for healthcare for the homeless at the Human Services Campus here in Phoenix years ago. 
she was seeing a lot of patients coming from hospitals um, that were very sick still and had no place to heal. So she started to fundraise. Um, if you ever met, meet her or have the chance to meet her in the future, it's pretty uh, hard to say no to her. So she uh, fundraised, a, got a lot of money donated to her. She actually put it in a shoebox in her clinic. And then someone finally said, Sister Adele, you need a, a bank account, because that's not very safe to have all that money in your, um, in your clinic. So fast forward 11 years later, we have two medical respite centers, which are kind of like mini hospitals, 50 beds each. Length of stay is anywhere from 35 to 40 days with a multitude of practitioners that help that patient. Two outpatient clinics. We have four mobile outreach neighborhood programs that go all over Maricopa County. We have street medicine, which is like backpack medicine. And then um, our, I think our most innovative program is called the Health Navigator Program. And in seven of the hospitals in the Valley, we have a navigator that's co-located in the emergency room. They work with the social workers and case managers. So when a homeless person or house, unhoused person comes into the ER, we work with them to find them resources. Uh, we try to get them into our medical respite center, get an appointment set up at our outpatient clinic, connect them with the mobile outreach or any other community service. And uh, so that, uh, obviously you can Imagine the social workers and case managers in the emergency rooms are thrilled that we're there. Some of the positions are grant funded, some the hospital pays for because they see our value. And so that's um, actually when I introduced Danielle, uh, we first were kind of connected with Danielle through our health navigator, Wendy Adams. And so um, I'll let you take it from here. I don't know how many minutes we have left. I don't either. Our timekeeper is Megan. She'll let you know okay. when you have one minute. And Seven, one minute. okay. Uh, my name is Danielle Millard. Um, I'm a, on the board of directors at Circle the City. Uh, so I first got diagnosed with Crohn's um, 12 years ago. And since then, I've had to have over 75 surgeries. So I've spent most of my life in hospitals or dealing with different types of healthcare facilities. I've been in pretty much everyone you could think of. I've been in skilled nursing facilities. Um, I had to go to rehab to relearn how to walk at one point. So I really have just spent so much of my time in hospital settings and then in 2020, in 2021, um, I lost my housing. I was living with a family member, and just because of all of the chronic health issues I have, uh, the situation didn't work out, and I ended up homeless. And it took me a really long time to get accepted to Circle of City. Um, I met their health navigator, Wendy, there. She's absolutely fantastic. Um, I got into their facility, and I was there for about a week before I got sick and ended up back in the hospital and um, had an infectious disease. So I couldn't go back to their respite facility. Um, but the people at Circle the City kept showing up for my entire health journey. So every time I was in the hospital, they would come in and help me try and find resources. Um, when I was out of the hospital, they helped me get to doctor's appointments and clinics if I needed to go. Um, so all of this help, and I was only a patient with them for seven days. Um, even now, um, I've been housed for about a year and a half. Um, the health navigator, Wendy, that she mentioned, uh, she still shows up every time I'm in the hospital. Uh, she comes in and checks on me, makes sure the doctors are doing their jobs. Um, and that's, like, that's what the health navigators do. Their position is so important because they're bridging the gap between their patients and the doctors. There's so much bias against the homeless population. Um, 
and there's not a lot of people out there who advocate for them, um, which is what's so unique about the health navigator position. Uh, they work directly with the patients and the doctors in the hospital, making sure that they get them to whatever facility we have that they need. Um, they follow up with the patients. Uh, they really keep up on the doctors because it can be really difficult to get them to listen to you um, as a patient, and especially as a homeless patient. Um, your voice isn't... Your voice isn't as strong when you're going in and talking to a doctor when you're in that situation. The idea that people choose to be homeless or that everyone who's homeless um, is mentally ill or a drug addict. And so going into the hospital, there's this bias there with the healthcare um, providers and the healthcare navigators kind of help bridge that gap so that our, um, our unhoused clients can get the medical care that they deserve, that they were not getting before. And I think the best thing that I've noticed in the hospitals is just the difference educating doctors and the nurses and the staff there makes. Um, it really, really changes how the homeless will respond. You know, they need to be able to trust their doctors. They need to have a good relationship with them. And that's not something that very many people who are homeless get, um, which is why Circle the City is such a fantastic organization because they're making sure that the homeless population is getting quality care. Thank you. All right, next, you can go, Kim. Certainly. Well, thank you, everybody, for allow uh, Kimberly. Kimberly. <laughs> no, Kim's up here. Kim's up here. <laughs> go ahead. So, which one? What? Uh, Kimberly. Uh, which one's that? Uh, Good morning, everybody. Um, Kim Russell, the Arizona Advisory Council on Indian Health Care. I am originally from Chinle, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation, and I've been living in the Valley for a little over maybe 25 years. So I, I, it was recently that I realized I'm more urban Indian than reservation-based um, Indian now. I never thought that would be, but I, I am. So I've been living here for quite a while and been a part of my state agency for about almost nine years. And a little bit about the agency that I'm a part of. Um, we do a lot of advocacy. So on the legislative level and also on the administrative level. Uh, we have a, a, <clears throat> sorry, an advisory council that's appointed by the governor to serve as a, the advisory um, to, to myself. And um, every year we put together a legislative agenda. And so um, I present to my advisory council members topics that I'm aware of that the legislature and the governor's office are kind of working through. Um, so just to give you an example of at least this, this past sessions, um, current sessions, priorities that we've been working on, um, making, having a adult dental benefit for those persons on Medicaid. We've been working for that for many, many years. We've been a part of a lot of oral health legislation over the past seven, eight years that I've been a part of the Advisory Council. So that's one legislative priority that we're working on. Hopefully that gets past this session. Um, another priority is anything having to do with missing and murdered Indigenous persons. Um, you probably have been hearing a lot of that in the news, right, actually very recently. Um, so, and that's, that, that's a huge issue to unravel. It's, it's just so big, right? And so we're, we're, any policies, any legislation that might impact that in a positive way is another issue that we're supporting. 
And um, I think those are probably the two priorities I wanted to share with you. But also in the past, we worked on legislation that would create an, a sixth area health education center. Um, that, those area health education centers really uh, allow for communities to produce primary care providers. Um, I think most of us in the room um, experience the lack of those primary care providers within our community and our, our tribal leadership decided, you know, we need one that's specific to the Indian health system, both on and off reservation. So my leadership said, Kim, go create that sixth AHEC. So I was given marching orders, very specific marching orders to do so. And we had to open up statutes to do that. It took us three sessions to pass that law, but we got it passed. And so our agency actually is implementing that sixth um, American Union Health Area Health Education Center. It is statewide. Um, I do want to mention that right now we only get state funding. We do not get the federal funding like the other AHECs do. We're working on being able to be um, on par with the other five AHECs because right now we, we don't get it. We don't, our funding is not the same. Um, and then um, we also, so those are just a few kind of policy items that could go on and on about some of our legislative policy that work we do. And then anything administratively. So a lot of the work that I do in state government is really with the Arizona Department of Health Services and the Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System. So um, being able to advocate when they uh, put together the administrative policies that it reflects our systems in a positive way. A lot of work in that space as well. Um, I want to maybe mention just a few things um, in terms of the, the grants that we have. Even to be able to... Um, apply for grants, we had to change our statute. And so that was kind of my first introduction as a new director to my agency about eight years ago. They, my leadership said update our statutes so we could do these certain things. One of them was to be able to accept funding because we didn't have that authority before. Um, so my, my, my leadership said, Kim, open up our statutes and figure out what we need to amend. I said, I'll do that. Went, ha went home and you know Googled statute. <laughs> So it's kind of like, I would just kind of, I always have the thing, you either sink or swim, right? And I'm always determined to swim. So one of the provisions that we were able to pass into law was the ability to accept grant funding. And so now we have different um, grants. And so we have, I believe, six or seven grants right now. Um, we are kind of like in a building stage as an agency because before then we didn't, we didn't have that ability. Um, even though we did have statutory authority to do that, we didn't jump right into getting grants. It took us another three, four years to create those uh, relationships with our tribal communities to do that. So it, there was, you know, there was a lot of um, relationship building that we need to do before we even thought about getting a grant. I wanted to just mention just a few of our grants um, uh, in regards to just, I guess, one that we have is a CDC CCR grant. I believe we have two other partners in, in the state who has this particular grant. And it really works with community health workers. I think you know, that's a new up and coming workforce, although it's at least in our, in our tribal communities, it's 60 years old. So it's not new for us. It's just that now there's, there's a formal recognition or certification process in place to the Department of Health Services. And now we're talking about Medicaid reimbursement. I think the table I was at, we were talking about you know, that sustainability. So we work with C CHRs with that particular grant. And then we have a grant um, through the Department of Health Services, the Arizona Health Improvement Plan. Um, one of the things that we were talking about in our grant is just um, through COVID, we've been able to define health a little bit more broad, right? Um, so we're going to be doing a housing assessment. I think maybe pre-COVID, I don't know if we would have been able to justify our space in housing like we can do now because how acts... Uh, access to housing is a social indicator of health, right? Just um, this past week, uh, maybe two weeks now, uh, my, my town got flooded. The, um, the, 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 the levees are up where the mountain, uh, the mountains near us, the snow started to melt and it, it broke and so we got flooded out. So my, my aunt was part of that flood. But there was other pre persons who were even more um, impacted by the flood. So my thoughts are, you know, how do, how, how are they going, are they going back to those homes, right? Is that, is that their only option is to go back to those homes? And for those that completely lost their homes, what, what's going to happen to them? Um, for those where the only option is to go back to that home, 
is it going to be safe for them to go back to? Right? So those are sort of things that I'm thinking, and I, I always tell my staff, all the work that we do, it, we bring it back to policy development. So I think that's unique about our agency is that we're an advocate for um, creation of policy. So that, that's what I make sure that my staff understands is the work that we do, how can it come back to creating new policy or um, updating policy so that we can change that particular policy that, for instance, the, the flooding. So now I'm thinking about, okay, how do we start having conversations with the Department of Housing around this? Um, and then one more thing I wanted to mention, I think maybe my time will be up, is we're going to be doing a tribal epi forum. Um, I don't think we've ever had a tribal, tribal epi forum um, in our state with our tribal stakeholders ever. I don't think so. I know it's been an idea that's been floated for quite a while. So we'll be having that. And as tribes, we recognize that state government has a lot of data on our people. But I think, that some, that I think in some instances, we don't even know the data that they have on us. And so we want to have this EPI forum just to just start those initial conversations um, with a few state agencies about what data do they have and how can our tribes access that data a little bit more better so that it can form them, um, inform them so that they can create policies and programs and really just provide better um, health care for their, for their citizens. And I think I'm at time. So thank you. Okay, hello, my name is Kim, and the third Kim of the day, I think. <laughs> um, I am here from the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and the Hard of Hearing. We are a state agency here in Phoenix. We represent uh, deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing people all over the state of Arizona. There are over 1.1 million people with hearing loss in Arizona, um, and that hearing loss spans a, a great range of different kinds of labels and, and accommodations. So what we do is advocate for those communities and, um, and look for barriers uh, to help make all kinds of things more accessible for the communities we serve. We have several different programs, such as we train and coordinate uh, support service providers for deafblind individuals. We have a free equipment distribution program for deaf, hard of hearing, and deafblind people. We provide a free healthcare training. Uh, you can see the flyer that we left on all of the tables. We have a care uh, presentation where we train organizations for completely free. Please stop by our booth over here on the right side of the, the room for more information. We provide free consultation for anyone who has any uh, questions or issues about um, access. We aren't attorneys, but we are subject matter experts in everything having to do with deaf, hard of hearing, and, and deafblind individuals. So we can, consulting with us can uh, save you time, save you money, and of course, provide the best level of care for your deaf, hard of hearing, and deafblind patients. Of course, we have several challenges in our communities. Unfortunately, most healthcare professionals are underprepared and are not aware of the uh, issues that we face or the accommodations that we need and are required by law. There's often a misconception that for anybody with hearing loss, that there is a one size fits all accommodation or um, what should be provided for access is going to be the same for anybody with hearing loss. But Unfortunately, it's quite different for different people. As you can see with the captions that are here on the screen, that is going to work for my colleague, Christy, who you met earlier because she's hard of hearing. Because I'm deaf, most deaf people use American Sign Language as their primary language, which means an interpreter is going to be my most effective accommodation rather than captioning. So depending on the person, the accommodation changes. We know that communication is vitally important for treating patients, but because most healthcare professionals and facilities don't understand the law, they don't understand what is their responsibility or what the options are for providing access to those patients. We really wanna see that change here. 
Of course, there are some really um, uh, ubiquitous systemic barriers. There may be, um, we have seen lots of situations where uh, medical providers are not providing um, interpreters or captioning or whatever that may, whatever accommodation may be needed, which means then that patient has a severely decreased level of access and doesn't get the same information from their healthcare providers. Deaf people are often discluded from their healthcare in general, especially when the person with the hearing loss is a child. 90% of deaf people are born to hearing parents and 90% of those parents never learn how to sign, which means most deaf people are um, go through life with some pretty severe uh, language deprivation, which affects them later in life, which obviously affects their health care. But it also means that they are not, they don't have access to that incidental peripheral learning that you have in your families where you learn about your family health care. So you find that many deaf people aren't aware of their family health histories or what kind of genetic disorders may be um, latent within their family. Deaf people also have uh, have to get their medical information from sources that most people wouldn't wouldn't consider. Obviously, most of us can pull up a website or read a pamphlet uh, to get information, but um, for a deaf person, that information is very rarely provided in American Sign Language, so those resources aren't available to us. Another of the big barriers that we face is the use of video remote interpreting, or VRI. Uh, it is a great technology, but unfortunately it's, it's uh, not reliable and is not always used properly. There is a federal law that must be followed for effective communication, and within that law it has requirements for the use of that um, technology, for example, there can't be any kind of internet issues. There, the screen can't be blurry or choppy. The audio has to be clear. Staff need to know how to set it up and where it's, and where it's stored. It has to be easily, easily set up. And if one of those requirements is not, um, is not present, then that technology is no longer allowed to be used by the Department of Justice. So it's often misused. There's also lots of other different uh, accommodations that people don't know about, like CART that we have here. They don't, people don't know where to, um, who to reach out to in order to get those accommodations. So what I'd really love to, is to see everybody here go back to your facilities and get a, a plan in place so that you know who to contact when those accommodations are, are requested. For example, Azha actually reached out to us to partner on a project. They have several videos on their website that now have captioning and sign language interpretation. And that was something that we did together. So just like Azha did, please feel free to contact us at any time for any question having to do with people with, with hearing loss. Not only can we provide that free training for your facility, but we can also consult with you on individual situations. And then, unfortunately, because there is such, this such a disparity for people, people in the communities that we serve uh, when they're seeking health care, we get a lot, of, um, a lot of stories from people in the community. So, for example, Christy, who you met before, um, sh she mentioned that she is hard of hearing. She had to take her teenage daughter to the hospital and even though she let them know that she was hard of hearing and asked them to take, her, take their mask down so that she could read their lips, um, the medical professionals refused and said, we'll just talk directly to your daughter, which means Christy was pushed out of being able to be a mother in that situation and being involved in her own daughter's health care. As a deaf patient, um, I have seen multiple... Uh, multiple instances where VRI is used in a medical setting, and some, some were effective, some were positive, but um, a lot of them aren't. Like for example, when um, 
there's one office that when I'm on the exam table and they bring VRI in, because of the way that the room is set up, I have to actually get up and move and sit in the like family chairs in the room rather than be on the exam table just to have communication. So it's important that, uh, sorry, excuse me, the, another issue is um, that many front desk reception areas are not aware of what they need to do in order to support people with hearing loss. There have been many times when I've gone into an appointment, have checked in, and the front desk receptionist absolutely knows that I can't hear. And I have sat in the waiting room while they called my name over and over again until they skipped my appointment. So what we don't want is deaf people missing out on their opportunity to, deaf and hard of hearing people to miss out on their opportunity to get the healthcare that they need, which happens quite a bit. So we would really love for everybody here to take a look at their policies, especially about VRI. Uh, VRI is not appropriate for everyone. Obviously, if somebody has a vision issue, that's not going to be effective. It's not appropriate for children. If you have any kind of technological issues in your clinic or in your facility, I mean, can you imagine going to get healthcare that you need and not being able to communicate with anybody because the internet isn't strong enough or the screen isn't, isn't producing a clear enough picture? That happens quite a bit. So understanding that most facilities are underprepared and are not aware of these issues, that is something that we really want to change by partnering with you all. There is a lot of misconception and maybe even fear about treating patients with hearing loss. We want to change that too. So again, what we want to do is partner with you. We want to work with you and support you through uh, making whatever changes are necessary to provide the best health care for your patients. And so please reach out to us at any time. And that's my time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That's the extent of my sign language. Um, thank you. That was the most fabulous panel. Um, now you all are going to have 10 minutes at your tables to discuss what did we hear, what are our reactions, and what are our questions of understanding, and for whom. As we've learned, you can't say, and this question's for Kim. <laughs> You're going to have to use last names or their organization to direct the question. So at your tables, and, and your questions are posted up here, you have... 10 minutes to answer these questions, formulate your questions from your table, and then we'll do call outs to the panel. Right, okay, you need a spokesperson and a facilitator, 10 minutes. Okay, if we can come back together, we'll begin our question and answer uh, session. So we're, I'm going to call out, like I did before, two table numbers. The first one will be ready to, the spokesperson will be ready to ask the question. The next table will get ready. We have two microphones. And remember to say who your question is for. Okay, table one followed by table seven. What is your question for our panel? So our question is for um, Kim Menard, and uh, we our discussion is in regards to is there a, a model they've seen in the community um, for the services they offer that is being done well in a standardized manner? For the deaf and the hard of hearing. Well, to answer your question, yes. We have hospitals that are providing sign language interpreters. Typically, an in-person interpreter is effective and a successful way to communicate. Also, CART, keep in mind, that's a resource that can be used. 
when I was outlining steps to follow, we have auxiliary aids as well that can be used. Again, it's important that you ask the patient what's the best accommodation for them. We shouldn't be making the decisions for them. We have to ask them, what do you need? Do you need American Sign Language interpreter? Do you need a card provider? Do you need an assistive uh, listening device? What are auxiliary aids that you need for your effective communication? And Kim, if I could, just yes. a yes. follow-up to clarify. Are you aware, or perhaps our Deputy Director Carmen Greensmith would be aware of any hospitals that are doing it right, that are role models for all of the other hospitals? Sure, I defer to Carmen, our executive, well, let me think. Uh, <laughs> yes, please, Carmen. Microphone. The microphone. Yep, there's a microphone. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, I am not really aware of a hospital that's doing it so wonderfully that we would say they get it just right. But we have had several hospitals that have allowed us in to do our training for them, and they in turn have followed up with uh, policy changes and processes for their staff. Oftentimes it's the frontline staff where these requests are made. So the things for the policymakers to do is to have that in place, to have agreements with interpreter, a, interpreting um, coordination agencies that can already be on contract with the hospitals so that your frontline people know who to call as well as any of your departments that might have advocacy, um, advocates in those departments to know those policies, to know who those partners are and who your contractors are. That is your best possible practice to have those things in place before you need them for CART services and interpreting services. Also, if you want to know if someone is licensed, you can always go to our website, acdhh.org, and you can look for that list, list of licensed interpreters, as well as contact us to get the name of interpreting agencies and they can provide that coordination service for you. And you've spoken with them in advance to know what your costs will be. Oftentimes that's the barrier, but if you're familiar with the ADA, you can find your guidelines there as well. And we'll be happy to answer any of your questions also. Hope that helps. Did that answer your question, table one? Yes. Yes, thank you. And they also have a table set up over here for lunch and break. All right, table number seven and then table number three. So we, this is for Circle the City. What seven hospitals are your nurse navigators in? So uh, they're actually like um, community health workers, patient navigators and not nurses. I'll clarify that. Okay, and I, okay, I just turned over 60, so bear with me. We have, um, uh, Banner University Medical Center, Banner Thunderbird, Banner Desert, Banner Australia, John C. Lincoln North Mountain. That's how, I'm sure it's called something different now, right, Sue? Honor Health um, on North Mountain and um, St. Joe's and Valley Wise. How many is that? Seven? Okay, seven. Hoo hoo. Um, and you answered your question. That was our what the job description was and like what their background is. So their case, you said they're I'm a community health worker. Community health workers. Yes. How many do you have? Do you know? Um, uh, seven, so seven right now. Okay, so just one for one each. One for each, yes. Facility. And it's not a billable service, you know, with the FQHC. So we try very hard to get the hospital to help pay. Not all of them do. Um, some are really good about it. And um, otherwise, we try to get a grant to cover that position. That's right. That was our yeah. other question, is how that funding yeah. is, is tied in. But we in. keep data, of, you know, how many touch points, uh, where we refer them. Uh, we, we have shown that we keep, uh, we have decreased the hospital stay, length of stay, oh. and also decreased the ER visits. Is there consideration to broaden the scope for a statewide implementation? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes. Just the money. Okay. And then, can we keep going, or do we have to? <laughs> only have one question. That that was good. We'll we'll hopefully circle back around. So your table seven next is table three, and then table six, you're up. 
Okay, um, you kind of started to ask the question. We were wondering the footprint in rural Arizona for Circle the City and how we could get a navigator at a rural facility. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm happy to share some of the data that we have. Um, I'll leave my contact information if you want to email me and I can show you the data for a few of the hospitals that we have been collecting it on. Um, I think it's kind of a selling, you have to really sell it to hospital administration that this is what you're going to get out of it. Um, I think almost maybe propose a pilot, you know, for 90 days, gather the data, show what we've been able to accomplish um, and kind of go from there. Did they answer your question? Did you answer? Good. All right, table, what are you, your table three? All right, six and then two. Table six and then table two. I hope I get these right. <laughs> the table is going to let me know if I didn't. So we have two questions, one for Kim Minard. Um, just what are the first steps for like rural, more rural hospitals and clinics to um, assess their, their hospitals um, on what they could be doing better, what are the first steps that they should be doing, finding an interpreter, things like that. And then I think you answered some of the um, questions to Kim Dupre, Dupre, Dupre and Danielle about Circle the City and the Community Health Navigators. Since they are similar to the community health workers and community health representatives and promotoras, are there ways to like advanced cost reimbursement for even community health network navigators like we are doing at Access with Community Health Workers. Is there any talk about that? So first, your first question was for Kim Menard. Okay. The first steps is to know what the needs of the patient is, know what they need. And also have, uh, do, do they like an interpreter? Do they, uh, do they need CART? And having those contracts in place with various agencies. Ensuring that all communication is accessible and that it's effective for the patient's needs. Now, uh, speaking of interpreters and VRI, I know that being in a rural community, the availability of interpreters may not be the best. So we just want to ensure that the video remote interpreting services that you use is at its best standards. Again, we have a backup plan ready, have interpreters ready that you can reach out and contact. Also with video remote interpreting, be sure that the interpreter is licensed as well. Again, contact us, we're here to help you. We can help you research that and get those needs met. And again, in rural areas, it may not be as uh, effective as in urban areas, but yes, we want to ensure that you have effective communication and successful communication with your patients. Great. Did she answer your question, table six? Okay. Did you, did you have a question for them or? Okay, your second question for Circle the City. Um, so I'll take this one. Um, Circle of City is very limited to the fact that, like, we're here for Maricopa County. Um, so we can't really do statewide programs. Um, but that doesn't mean that your hospitals can't, like, model off of our health navigators, find programs like this. Um, you know, just get, start getting people involved. Let them know that this is going to, like, add value to your hospital. It's going to be taking care of a very specific group of people. And you really is just, yeah, it's, it's starting your programs yourself, you know? Um, and having people who are excited about it and passionate about it because it's not going to be easy to get it going. Um, there are a lot of unique, um, a lot of unique healthcare needs for the homeless. And so it's educating people and trying to trying to get rid of those biases. But if, if the hospitals 
are looking at the homeless or the unhoused population as people they don't want in their hospital, it's going to be harder to get that going. So it's really important that you have people who really believe in the program to get it going. I think Danielle will be happy to do a road trip. Yes. <laughs> so you're saying you can help people copy your programs? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Did they answer your question, table six? Mm -hmm. All right. Table two followed by table four. Hi there. This one is for Kim Russell. Uh, so obviously not all tribal communities uh, are built equally and have the same type of resources. How do we develop better processes to learn and find out about local tribal needs? And following up on that, how do we find out resources or opportunities to help disenfranchised Native Native individuals? That's a huge question. Um, so I can talk about maybe from a state level view um, how we're trying to, um, I think, just know more about local tribal needs, right? And I think uh, for me, I think it's more local. If you can do it more locally, the better that you can do that type of um, investigation. So um, I'll talk about maybe um, how, how we're trying to do it. Our, our scope is statewide, and so when we d dig into data, we understand that the data doesn't really reflect our population. So it's kind of good and bad in some ways. Um, so uh, the best thing that I've, I've, I see is that local communities do those uh, assessments locally, and so just providing that support to do so. The other thing I recognize is that the ability and, and knowledge to do those, to do those assessments and so I, I take it upon myself to mentor um, young indigenous per persons who are going into uh, may, mainly public health fields because that's kind of where the work happens, right? Um, so in, in my capacity, I do a lot of policy work, um, working with um, both administrative and legislative. So I take on young, mostly young indigenous women who want to work in this field. And I think um, you know, the theme being equity um, there, there's not a lot of positions like mine that have that opportunity. So I feel since I have this position and this uh, insight into policy making, I need to pass that down. So right now I have four young women who are very interested in policy making. Um, I don't think they may they would have had another outlet if if I wasn't in this position, right? So that's what I. Well, I recognize, so I meet with them almost on a weekly basis because we're in session right now at the legislature. Um, so again, going back to local needs, um, I think if you just look, look into your community and figure out what that, I mean, it's a really simple question to me, right? Um, but kind of going on to the, having the expertise to do those assessments, you need to have our people to become educated. So again, I have four of our, uh, young indigenous women who are following me around with uh, the legislature right now, really just tracking legislation and understanding it. Um, so investing in, in our own people, I think. Um, I think that's really the concept we have with our AHIC. And I know we're geared more towards clinical primary care providers, but to grow our own health care providers. So I really, um, I commit a lot of my time to educating or at least informing our, our young adults professional adults so that they can continue in that career ladder so that, and we always say to come home, right? I don't know if you've heard that, but a lot of our teachings as indigenous people is, you know, go home, go, go get your education and come home. But it's kind of difficult to come home. You know, I've been in the Valley for over 25 years. I'm trying to figure out how to come home because I don't know if I have the job back home, right? But um, again, you know, going back to local needs. I think if you can really look into your community, we talked about community health workers, great resource, great resource to tap into within our tribal communities. Those are our CHRs. Um, we tap into CHRs all the time because they're going to tell us what the community needs. So, um, but just, just my thoughts on that. And I think you had a second question, right? So, yeah. So just to clarify, so your commission doesn't maintain records or logs of kind of contacts or this is the person that, that various groups should reach out to? So our, our normal, usual stakeholders are gonna be tribal health directors. 
for the most part. So that's usually our primary okay. point of contact is our tribal health directors. And each tribe is going to be different. Um, we call them tribal health directors, but they're not very, they're a little bit different than county health departments, right? Sure. I think county health departments have a little bit more authority rather than um, tribal health departments. So they, we call them similar names, but their authority is a little bit different. Um, Again, the infrastructure is different. The resource investment is different. So they're, they're a little bit different. But for the work that we do, it's usually those tribal health directors and then also our urban Indian health programs. We have four in our state. So for those that are off reservation, we have two here in the city and then one in Tucson and then um, and, uh, Flagstaff. And then we have our IHS. So that I just kind of described that ITU system. Um, that's IHS, tribal, and then urban. And do you maintain those lists? Because, you know, thinking about my case, co my case managers trying to figure out what resources are available, I mean, I'll have, I'll have patients flown in for, you know, four hours, five hours in various directions. You know, we won't have the nearby relationships or even really know how to start with a three-day admission. So, I mean, are there references or materials you have at your, your level, the commission level, to help us do our job a little more effectively or easier. Right, I think that's the challenge because um, just for example, I'll, I'll take my, my family. Um, we live in the center of my reservation. So any which way off the reservation is at least an hour and a half. So for hospital care, we either go to uh, Farmington, Flagstaff, and sometimes here in the Valley. So um, when that happens, there's at least for, for my example, we, that, con that connection's lost. It really is. Um, there isn't that link that was kind of described with Circle of the City. I'll, I don't think there is. There's some to an extent, but I'll take my, uh, my, my family. There was no link back when my mother was flown here to Gilbert. None whatsoever. So we really had to follow up with her um, with that. She was also flown out into Flagstaff. And there's, there's just a huge breakdown. So in terms of a connection, it would probably have to be the hospital that they were flown out from. So for my mother, it would have been Chinle IHS. Okay. Um, but there's always a difference there. If she, if she, if she got, if she, something happened here and she was um, referred um, to here, it would be so different. I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is our system is very complicated at times <laughs> and under-resourced. So it's no wonder that you're not finding that connection, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think if, I don't know if you have a, a, a relations team within your hospital, but really an un, inner, almost like a, a governmental relations team with the sovereigns because our tribes are sovereigns. Um, that's something I would recommend for hospitals who, um, if you do get a high indigenous population coming into your facility, mm -hmm. then consider you know, establishing maybe like a tribal liaison or some sort of office that can then work with the different tribes in Arizona. So that, a recommendation, I guess. And I don't know if there's a model of that already, a, a, a hospital who, who does that that's not IHS or tribal, but that, that might be something to consider. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Where, what hospital or where, what do you represent? Can you use the microphone, please? Uh, we're, uh, this is the question from the table. So we have you know, someone from Holbrook, area, Winslow. Um, I'm from Canyon Vista Medical Center, um, and you're with the Gila River. So it, it's a question from the table, not necessarily just from me. And um, right. the thank question you. was, what hospital is he with? Yes, thank you. Table four followed by table eight. Okay, um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. This question is for Kim Menard. Um, Kim, it's a two-part question. Um, at Valley Wise Health, where I work, we have a large refugee population. What uh, special needs or services um, are available for individuals who speak, or excuse me, who use sign language other than American Sign Language? And the second part of that question is, it is my understanding that in some families, to your comment, that 90% of parents who have a child who is deaf do not learn sign language. I know that there are some families that develop their own version of sign language. And how do we meet the needs of those individuals? Thank you. 
Okay, yeah, that's a really great question. I'm happy that you asked. So for the refugee population, uh, it's important to know that ASL is uh, the sign language that's used here in America. It's not a universal language. Individual countries have their own sign languages. So if a person uses a sign language from another country, you will probably need a team of interpreters, one hearing certified and licensed interpreter, and one interpreter called a certified deaf interpreter. Now, that certified deaf interpreter may not know the uh, specific sign language that's used in, their, in the patient's native country, but because of their lived experience and their, um, as a deaf person and their interpreting skill, uh, they are able to bridge that communication gap between the person who uses a foreign sign language and the hearing sign language interpreter that you work with. So now to your second question, uh, the Sorry, excuse me, going back to the, the answer from the first question, um, a CDI, a Certified Deaf Interpreter, is something that we recommend using with deaf children as well. So remember how we talked about that language delay? Um, even if a child doesn't have that language deprivation, they could also have additional disabilities. And so working with a CDI, a Certified Deaf Interpreter, in those situations with deaf children is the best way to provide access. So now to your second question. Uh, you had you had uh, mentioned the 90% of deaf children um, not being able to communicate with their parents and lots of family developing what we call um, home signs. That is usually a combination of uh, some written form, some gesture, um, something like that. Now, the deaf individual may also know American Sign Language, the formal language because maybe that's what they use in school, maybe they hang out with deaf friends. So ASL is may still be part of their life even if they have to use home signs at home because their family just doesn't know American Sign Language. If you come into a situation where the deaf individual really only has access to those home signs, again, a certified deaf interpreter is going to be your language specialist that will bridge that gap. Does that answer your question? Yes, does that answer Perfect. your question? All right, great. Table eight followed by table five. You all said you had a question. Now there's only two of you back there, but you said you had a question. Table eight and then five, where's eight? Okay, ready. Okay, so our question is for Circle the City and it's kind of a three part question. Um, the first part is, do you take patients outside of Maricopa County? Um, second question would be, what are the qualifiers for you to take a patient outside of Maricopa County? And then also, do you offer any kind of transportation services to get them to Circle the City if you do accept them? So um, we would accept patients out of Maricopa County, if we, especially if the respite centers, if we had an opening, a bed. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, uh, our Grant with HRSA is for Maricopa County, but they we still do like a zip code analysis um, reconciliation every year with our UDS measures. And so we are adding zip codes outside of Maricopa County, especially with our outreach teams. But we've had calls from different cities and towns across the state to see if we can accept a patient. And we certainly would be open to that and we could providing there's a bed. Uh, obviously the, the beds are full most of the time. We did receive a large grant to open up a 100 bed respite center in the East Valley. So we're working on finding a city that will accept us there, which I thought was is a lot, much harder than I thought it would be. Um, that's a whole nother conference. That's a, yeah. But a anyway. <laughs> um, so anyway, did I answer all those questions? Um, oh, and then transportation, we probably would not have um, transportation, but we would definitely be open to having them come to us. And then, um, I don't know this one, um, what would be the qualifiers for you to take a patient? So um, there are, uh, for our respite centers, it's, it's an acute medical illness or injury. We take the sickest of the sick because we only have 100 beds total right now. And so uh, very sick homeless patients, they have to be independent in their ADLs. Um, because the, the, it's kind of a dormitory type setting and they have to walk or wheel down the hallway to the clinic. 
So they have to be able to um, get in the shower, get in the bathroom, and get to the clinic. So, um, so anyway, I think that's for the most part. Yeah, that answered it. Thank oh, you. Welcome. Thank you, Table 8. Table 5 will be our last question. I um, believe all of our questions were answered. All of your questions were Thank answered. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like this half of the room to give a hearing round of applause, and I would like this half of the room to give a sign language round of applause.